degrees uh, same longer than Delta. He's a biologist uh, with his PhD in animal behavior from the animal rights organization at Boston College. Um, I'm sorry, at New York University. <laughs> um, in addition to published papers on the behavioral ecology of bats, birds, and turtles, Falcon has written many scholarly and lay articles on animal use and education and research. And research. A popular speaker, he has given invited presentations in the USA, UK, Canada, Japan, Brazil, Israel, and then on Europe. And he is about to come out with his latest book, Pleasurable Kingdom, Animals and the Nature of Feeling Good. So please welcome, Jonathan, welcome. Thanks, Tim. It's a pleasure to be back at Boston College. I was here three or four years ago, and I uh, love the historic field of this campus. Uh, I should give credit to American universities by just correcting him that I, I didn't get my PhD at York University. I did my undergrad in biology there. I got my PhD at the University of Tennessee. And uh, I so love this country that I decided to stay. I uh, mean, I've lived in the US ever since. Uh, I now live in Maryland, which is in the suburbs of north of Washington, DC. So yes, the theme and the content of this talk will follow fairly closely, albeit with much less detail, to the contents of my book, which actually uh, doesn't hit bookshelves until next month. Uh, if you decide you'd like to buy a copy, there are some copies here, and they'll be for sale for the special offers rate of $20, the cover price is just under $25, and of course, I'd be more than happy to sign it to you. In the amazing and delightful circumstances that there are less books than there are people who want to buy them, uh, I can certainly, you can pay me, and I can send you a signed copy in the mail, so there's another option, or you could just uh, take, I could take your contact, contact information and send you more from the mail. So there's several options to get the book. Okay, Pleasurable Kingdom. Let's just move on here. A little bit of history. This is Rene Descartes, a brilliant scholar, philosopher, mathematician, not very popular with people who are in support of animal rights and animal welfare because he uh, basically thought that animals were mindless automatons and that uh, they had no souls and therefore it was okay to do anything you wanted with them. Uh, his, he, his teaching remains quite influential today uh, in the way animals are often treated in certain human activities. This fellow you may recognize is Charles Darwin, who came along a couple of centuries or a century and a half after Descartes. And um, Darwin is an incredibly influential guy, very creative, and made a number of very important insights during his, his life, but uh, the most profound and relevant to the topic of my talk would be that uh, we sort of all evolved from the same source, we're all connected biologically, which is to say that you know, we're all related to, the humans are related to monkeys and mice and lobsters, etc. ultimately. Which is pretty profound, because up until that time, religious, religious ideas dominated the notions of where humans came from and were created from God. And of course, a lot of people would still believe that, or they may try and reconcile that belief with the evolutionary theory. Uh, but Darwin you know, created a lot of controversy, but also laid the groundwork for us being connected to all other life forms. I'll stand on this side a bit. This is Donald Griffin. He's more recent still. And uh, he, uh, he died actually three years ago at the age of 88. And uh, he did a couple of really important things during his scientific career, an American, by the way. First, in 1938, he co-discovered echolocation in bats as a graduate student at Harvard University. How bats navigate in the dark would be a mystery for centuries. So that was a very important breakthrough. Uh, but that wasn't enough for Donald Griffin. About 40 years later, he started agitating, if you will, for animal minds and animal thinking and animal cognition. And he's considered the modern day founder or father of the field of cognitive ethology. Ethology is my field, it's the study of animal behavior. And as you can probably divine, cognitive ethology is the study of animal behavior in, in the context of thinking and mindedness. Okay? 
And this was important and timely because much of the 20th century was dominated by a dogma uh, based on this uh, a discipline called behaviorism, uh, which basically took an agnostic view of animal minds and animal thinking. Animals, according to behaviorism, uh, not quite like Descartes, are just merely automata, but, but, but essentially behaviorism had it that we couldn't get inside the animal mind, and therefore there was no point in discussing it or studying it. So functionally it meant that animals weren't thinking. Donald Griffin changed that with his books Animal Thinking, or the, que the Question of Animal Awareness, Animal Thinking, and Animal Minds, and a number of other papers that he wrote. And so he did a lot to set the stage and contribute to the stage that we have today, which is that there's something, I would say, of a renaissance or a revolution in terms of animal minds, animal thinking, animal emotions. It's, you, you can go to the bookshop and find books, and you can go to the magazine counter, and you'll find cover stories, the stories in there, Scientific American Mind, very recently, a new scientist. These, these journals are doing a lot about, writing a lot about animal emotions. It's interesting that they may still be asking the question, do animals have feelings? That was the title of a recent article in Scientific American Mind. In my view, it shouldn't be a question anymore. There's no question they have feelings. The question should be, what are the nature of their feelings? And what are the manifestations, etc. But I think it's safe to say, and there is a pun coming here, so be forewarned, that the likes of Darwin and Griffin have done a lot to put the horse before Descartes. <laughs> Okay, first of all, I want to just cover a few bases as to why we should expect animals feel pleasure. What basis do we have for thinking that animals might feel pleasure, quite apart from actual evidence, which I will move on to subsequently. First, pleasure is adaptive. This gets back to Darwin. Animals feel pain. Let's put it this way. Pain is nature's way of punishing maladaptive behavior. Okay? If you do something harmful or dangerous to yourself that might kill you or otherwise maim you, could uh, lessen your ability to contribute genes to the next generation, nature will tend to punish that. In other words, through evolutionary time, animals have, have, have developed senses, and one of the roles of those senses is to punish us for doing maladaptive things. Conversely, pleasure is nature's way of rewarding adaptive behaviors. Behaviors that keep you alive, behaviors that are important to survival, behaviors that are, behaviors that are important to procreation. Another way of looking at this is to, and an important concept I think, is to think of life as two, in, on two levels, two planes of existence. One is the evolutionary plane. This is the stuff of Darwinian fitness, natural selection, selfish genes if you like. This is the stuff of leaving copies of your genes in the next generation, to put it really mechanically. Very important, very important way of understanding animal behavior, understanding life. Uh, but there's another way of looking at existence, and that is the experience of existence, the experience of one's life. This is the stuff of the here and now, what you're actually feeling as a sentient being. Let me give a couple of examples to sort of drive home the point. Ask yourself, what is my goal in life? Is it A, to lead a happy and good life? Or is it B, to maximize my reproductive output? Now, with the exception of some sper uh, sperm donors and some undergraduate students that I've known, most people will say, A, my goal in life is to lead a happy and good life. Here's another example. Why do I put spice in my food? Is it A, because it makes my food taste good? Or is it B, because it wards off intestinal parasites? A recent issue of an important journal called the Quarterly Review of Biology uh, discussed this question of why we put spice in our food and it discussed it from an evolutionary ultimate sort of context and concluded that the most likely reason, and there were four possibilities, were, uh, was that it wards off intestinal parasites. There's some other possibilities, such as it, it helps us sweat in hot climates and that helps to maintain a stable body temperature and that sort of thing. Uh, but they only looked at ultimate 
evolutionary context to address that question. There was no discussion about uh, the sense, the, the, the experience of taste, for instance. But really, I mean, when you reach into the spice cabinet for the chili powder or the curry powder, are you thinking, I feel like I've got a bit of a higher parasite load today in my gut than I had yesterday. Let's try and clear some of that out. No, you're not, are you? You're thinking, I like the taste. You put it on there because it, it, it enhances the pleasure, the experience of your food. Now, a really important following point from making this distinction is that the ultimate evolutionary factors, the getting rid of the parasites in your stomach, the leaving copies of your genes in the next generation, are entirely compatible with the proximate experiential. There's no reason, these aren't in conflict. The hope, the pleasure, the pain, that experiential stuff is because evolution works on natural selection and evolution is favoring adaptive and punishing maladaptive behavior. So I really shouldn't have asked the question to go back. These are not really A or B, even though I said or. They're really A and B. It's just a different level, a different way of looking at the question, the phenomenon. And that's very relevant to animals. I argue in my book that humans are not the only ones who, who, whose lives we can look at in the evolutionary context and the experiential context. The reality is we are not the only feeling experiencing beings on the planet. There are some who dogmatically would, would continue to argue that they actually we are the only ones. And certainly we certainly have things that we are unique. But there, there are unique aspects of pretty much any organism out there because of the milieu they've evolved in, the way they're particularly adapted to their own ecology. All right, second reason why we should expect that animals experience pleasure is simply that we also experience pleasure. This is sort of argument by analogy. And if we draw parallels between our own bodies and those of certain other animals, mammals would be the easiest case, but I would argue vertebrates in general, there are parallels there, then we might expect that they too can feel some of the pleasurable experiences that we can. Uh, just, just look at brains, and I'm not really a brain expert, uh, but during my research on this book, I learned a bit about the limbic system. Uh, it's involved in emotional expressions. It's one of the most primitive human brain features. Ergo, it exists in other, certainly other mammals, and probably some other vertebrate representatives as well. Many, many other mammals share it. And then sensory pleasures are believed to, at least by some, to occur in three discrete groups, three, three types. At the neural level, uh, we have, at the neural level, we have food pleasure, drug pleasure, and sex pleasure. That's perhaps a simplistic way of looking at it, but it's a, it's a sort of a model, if you like, of brain function that uh, isn't limited only to our own species. And just one other thing about um, the experience of pleasure is that it's multifaceted. <coughs> It, there's many ways that it's expressed. Uh, we know as humans, we, we feel pleasure in so many ways, such as uh, humor, anticipation, surprise, um, pride. I mean, you, we could, you could ecstasy, you could make a long list. And granted, these are semantic ways, but these words capture different ways that we feel uh, positive affect as psychologists. Three, animals feel pain and distress. Interestingly, there's really not much debate or controversy among scientists that animals experience and feel negative affect, that they feel pain and distress. And that's reflected in uh, scientific writing, research, and journals. There are over 20 journals that have the word pain in them. And a lot of these journals, in fact, most of them are human, about human medicine and human pain but a lot of them have also studies of animals in there. <coughs> it's a legitimate area, uh, and it's an area that's talked about. Uh, but the other side of the coin, animal, animal, uh, sorry, the other side of the coin, the pleasure side of the spectrum, there's very little, there's no journal that talks about pleasure. There's a journal, Happiness Studies, which is about the closest it gets to. But interestingly, this goes beyond just talking about animals. It's very interesting that human culture has spent very little time ruminating about pleasure in positive states, and a lot of time talking about the very important concept of, of pain and suffering. Very important, but I would say that the other end of that experiential spectrum, that the, that whole area of pleasures and positive experiences is also very important morally, ethically, uh, and a big part of our lives. I mean, a lot of our day-to-day -day decisions are based on what re what's rewarding for us. The food we choose to eat, the films we go and see, the sports we pursue, 
uh, the hobbies we have. Pleasure is massive in our lives, and yet interestingly, we've spent very little energy and thought about pleasure on the basis of our pleasure. Uh, just going to give you some examples of the evidence that animals feel pain or and or suffering and distress. Sort of a, these are again just terms that help to give us some sense of what we're talking about. We don't know what's going on in an animal body, but but um, we can at least get some idea, and we can get some evidence of whether something is negative to them. Something that I've done, some research I've done, which is to say, looking at published literature, so sort of analyses of other people's work, is um, how routine procedures in laboratories, how animals respond to those. And uh, corticosterone is considered the sort of the, or a stress hormone. It's an indicator of uh, the negative experience, particularly if the context is negative. So if corticosterone levels go up in the bloodstream, that's usually an indicator that the animal is not liking it and not happy about it. Ca moving a cage caused, this is an average maximum increase, an average maximum increase of 63% in rats in the study that I looked at. I think it, that, that was more than one study. Now, handling, meaning just picking the animal up and putting the animal down, uh, caused, a, as you can see, pretty pronounced increases in corticosterone levels in the bloodstream. Being bled from the tail tip, you might expect that would be a higher because it's probably more painful, and it's definitely, you would predict, more painful than being handled, and therefore more stressful and unpleasant. Similarly, higher levels. And gavage, which is oral dosing, putting a tube down the throat into the stomach, which is used to deliver uh, a, a compound to an animal in, in testing and study and certain uh, research procedures, also appears to be very stressful to the, these animals if corticosterone levels are being measured. This is for rats. Now we're looking at case change. Another way of measuring negative affect is changes in heart rate, that's HR here, or blood pressure. Uh, increases would suggest that the animal is increasingly stressed. Here we have rhesus monkeys, heart rate's going up 46%. That's, again, average maximum increase. And in rats, uh, increases, as you can do, you can make the numbers here. And blood pressure also rose from these animals. This is just a few other species. The case of uh, the fruit bats, geese, ducks, and starlings, and hens, I think. Well, the hens were probably domesticated, but otherwise uh, they were wild-caught animals, and you would expect probably greater increases in wild animals that had no exposure to human handling, and they would probably just find it that much more stressful. They probably see it as a predation situation, and it's probably the end of the line for them, is, is probably, if they're thinking about it at all, and I would argue they are, uh, that that's what they're, that's what they're thinking. How animals behave can, can give you some clues that they may be able to feel pain. This is a lizard that lives in the uh, deserts of southern Africa and has this uh, somewhat comical habit of raising the legs. They actually alternate the legs. There are benefits to being up on the sand for the heat and finding prey, but it gets mighty hot there during the middle of the day. And there's a period before they dart under the sand where they'll actually lift the legs, presumably to tolerate the heat. I, I don't know. This is one of the challenges. You don't know what the animal's experiencing. But behavior can give you some clues. Also, just want to mention psychological effects. Here's a list of some of the um, negative outcomes that animals may show in situations where they're deprived of natural behaviors, such as being kept in very small cages, where animals typically live in laboratory situations. They may be deprived of social outlets, etc., And that has negative effects on them. And these are just some examples. Stereotypies, by the way, are repetitive functionless behaviors, uh, such as flipping repeatedly, running back and forth. You may have seen it at some zoos. Animals may pace back and forth, particularly animals with very large home ra ranges, need a lot of space. If they're deprived of that chronically, they can develop um, various negative behaviors. And I would say that's evidence for a mental life. If an animal shows negative responses to uh, a psychological source, it's not really a physical source, although you could argue that, then it suggests a mental life complex mind and a sense of maybe consciousness. I'm not going to suggest that the animal's thinking, oh, I hate being here, I wish I could be where I, there, where I, where I belong. That's kind of, not necessarily that, but some kind of negative uh, experience, mental experience. Finally, animals behave as if they feel pleasure. And a lot of the rest of the talk will be uh, some examples of that. Um, for me, again, it's my field. Behavior is a window on feelings and emotions. It's a way to see what's going on. There are other ways of assessing FX, such as we saw earlier, corticosterone levels, heart rate, etc. But to observe behavior is one of, the, one of the more clear ways of seeing what may be going on inside an animal. 
what they do individually, such as scratching, interactively, grooming, body postures, facial expression, anticipation, activity, soliciting more, etc. Uh, put your hand up if you've lived with a cat or a dog in your life. Uh, put your hand up if you've petted the animal. It should be the same hands. <laughs> You're pretty mean if you haven't, or else self depriving because it's quite enjoyable for the pet as well. Uh, put your hand up if you've ever had the experience of the animal nudging you for more when you've withheld the petting. It's a pretty common thing. Now, we don't know what the animal's thinking, but I think that's a nice example of an animal liking it and wanting more of what they like. Anticipation. I like anticipation. It's a, really, it's a really interesting phenomenon because it suggests, and there are arguments one can make to, to suggest otherwise, but to me it suggests not just living in the present. It suggests an awareness of some possible future event, and I'm looking forward to it. In this particular study, 24 male rats uh, were accustomed to either going into a standard cage or a forced swim. Let's see, do it in order. Sexually receptive female, male rats, they were trained to expect access to a sexually receptive female, feminist in the room, I didn't design the study, uh, or an enriched cage, or a standard cage, or a forced swim. The rats who had been trained to expect the first two showed a great deal of agitative, moving around active activity, activity and behavior that is associated with, with um, anticipation of a positive event in rats. Those who were gonna go into a standard cage or forced swim, not pleasant things for rats, we presume, didn't show that level of anticipation. They didn't show any anticipation for, for pleasure with that. Okay, now let's move to the evidence. What is the evidence that animals experience pleasure? What have, has actually been observed in them beyond merely arguing for why we should expect them to experience pleasure? First of all, play. Of all the expressions of pleasurable, positive feelings that animals evince, the most, the least controversial would be play. You can open pretty much any textbook on animal behavior and you'll find a section on play in there. Play is widely accepted uh, as a, uh, it's a, it's a manifestly existing phenomenon in animal behavior. It doesn't necessarily assume the animals are enjoying it, but we tend to assume they are. We, again, it gets back to the uh, parallels. We enjoy play, animals play, they show every indication that they're enjoying it, and so we tend to think that they are enjoying it. Let's delve a little bit more into play. There's a number of reasons why play is considered adaptive, and why it should have evolved. First of all, here's just a list of them. It's useful for developing physical strength, for gaining skills that will be useful when you become an adult. This may help explain why play is more prevalent in younger animals when they're learning the ropes. Acquiring knowledge in general, uh, social behavior is very important to learn the ropes. Play, play has rules, and you shouldn't break the rules. If you do, you may be an outcast. You may not be able to play with that particular one whom you bit too hard last time. And finally, uh, exploring one's environment. So there's a number of ultimate adaptive bases for animal play behavior. But again, that's the evolutionary context. It, that those I just listed could be an answer to why animals play. But another answer in this context of why animals play is it's fun. The animals are not thinking about developing strength, gaining skills, learning social ropes. All very important, all very useful to the animal. But I don't think they're, that's what's going on in here. They're doing it because they're drawn to do it. It's fun, it's rewarding. And that's that nice synergy between the adaptive basis for behavior and the immediate experience basis just a quote from a book, Souls of Animals. While play may prepare us to cope with life's more serious business, play is itself not serious. It is carefree and teasing. Its fun element is what characterizes it. I think that captures play. I mentioned earlier that play is important for developing social skills. And it's very important that play be clearly signaled and that an animal let another one know that he or she wants to play. Because a lot of the context of play is survival behaviors. Chasing, if you're a young predator, you, gotta learn, you wanna learn to chase. And a lot of predator play is chasing, of course. So is a lot of prey play is chasing because you gotta know how to run away. Uh, rough and tumble play is very important as well. Wrestling, fighting. I live with two kittens who are now getting pretty big and I'm 
I'm delighted to say that they still play just about as much as when they were little pipsqueaks. And uh, it's not a good watch, but it's so neat to see the restraint in play. You know, a cat can really bite. They've got teeth and strong jaws. That's what they do well to do. But, you know, when, when you stick your hand and I play with them, they restrain themselves. They learn to hold back. And when they're playing with each other, they're drawing away on each other's paw or something. But you see them, you know, they're not, they're not, they know that there's a limit. They learn that there's, that there's too hard to bite and, and, and there's the right amount of pressure to put on in play. In biting, in play fighting. In serious fighting, those rules are out the window and then they go all out, perhaps. But play is, a lot of play is about restraint. And actually there's one ethologist named Mark Beckhoff who's been writing about play a lot as an expert on play. And he's talking about it may actually be the basis of some moral behavior that we experience. And we may not assume that we're the only species with any sense of morality. Granted, an animal may not understand the concept of morality, but the way they behave may be consistent with some degree of sense of right and wrong. This is a dog named Ben. He's a frequent visitor to a lovely park in York where I just lived for a couple of years in the UK. And his 83-year-old guardian would throw a tennis ball for him. And he exhibits uh, a nice example of anticipation behavior. Uh, you've probably seen this before. The dog's all alert, waiting for the ball to be tossed. And when the ball gets tossed, he's off ahead of the ball. You may be able to see this blurry object here. Occasionally, you get these mean-spirited dog owners who uh, stake it, you know, the dog goes running off and the dog, where's the thing when you come back? But of course, the dog would soon t uh, catch on to that as well. She wasn't a faker, she would always throw the ball. And he would always be off running ahead of the ball. So anticipation is an element of play. Uh, a little bit about Rosie. Um, Rosie is a cat I live with, and um, like many cats, he's a toy snob. He's very specific about which toys he likes. He would ignore uh, a lot of these commercial toys, like the sponge balls with the bells in the middle that seem more for accumulating on the furniture than for amusing cats. Uh, but he had a couple of toys he really liked. One was uh, a commercial toy called the Cat Dancer. I'd recommend it. It's a high-tension piano wire with little bits of uh, paper on the end. Uh, and it just moves in a certain kind of almost unpredictable way. Cats go gaga over it. So I'd recommend that one. He also liked my tie. This is one of my older ties, which I don't wear anymore for obvious reasons. And, uh, but like most cats, he was selective about the toys. Um, and his behavior to get my attention to play with him was, was uh, I think, a good illustration of, a, of the uh, anticipation and desire for play. He had the misfortune of being one of three cats, the other two who were much older than him. The other two died at old age. We were left uh, with just Rosie as the only cat. He's named Roscoe in the book, by the way, because uh, it's a long story, but he ended up with kind of a feminine name. He was a male cat. He didn't have any sand. He didn't get them anyway. But uh, for, not to confuse readers, his name got changed in the book. In any event, um, he had devices for getting my attention when he wanted to play. Uh, one was he would come starting into the room. Uh, starting is an ethology term. It means kind of jumping on all fours. And he'd come in with his sideways, and his back reared, his tail brushed out. You may have seen this behavior in cats. It's commonly exhibited in kittens, and it's often in a sort of a context of you know, threatening, like, watch it, I'm big, don't challenge me, or I'm scared. But they try and make themselves look big. A lot of animals do that. Well, I am a lot bigger than Rosie, but I'm no threat to him. He knows me. He knows I'm not an enemy. He's not doing this behavior for that reason. He was doing it, in my opinion, to get my attention. And it worked. You know, he'd come in like that, and I'd turn around and see him there. And he'd be looking at me. Uh, and my interpretation was, and cats may not probably don't think of the way we do in the language that we do, but if you put words on it, it's like, I'm trying to get your attention. If that failed, he'd get on a stool about eye level, and he would look at me, and then to look up and meow at the ceiling with a very strange barking meow, it was very distinctive to that context, and then look back at me. Clearly, again, trying to get my attention. Usually, I would then put the book down, or whatever I was doing, and roll a hazelnut horn or play the cat dancer. Uh, and so there's an element of conditioning in here, for, for sure. Uh, but I do believe he had some sense of wanting to play and knowing what would work to get him to play with me. Oh, just some examples of sliding birds. Birds, uh, I just don't want you to think that play is restricted only to mammals. There's a lot of examples of play in certain groups of birds, parrots being one example. Kias are New Zealand parrots. They're known also for demolition play. That's a new term, which is when they dismantle cars at ski resorts. They take, tear off rubber and bits of chrome. They're very strong, they're big parrots, and they're very socially complex, and they engage in a lot of play, play types of behavior, and sliding down car windows is one of the things they do between tearing bits of 
things off the cars. Crows have been observed sliding down from the roof. Ravens, close relatives of crows, and penguins slide on snow and ice. Sometimes it's a way to get around and taste penguins. Uh, but I would suggest there's some play and fun in, in some of that sliding. Tico is an Amazon parrot, a 45-year-old parrot adopted by a, an, an, an ornithologist who actually is at Rutgers University, Joanna Berger, wrote a great book called The Parrot Who Owns Me. I would recommend that book. And it gives some great insights into parrot behavior from the con in the context of an individual living with another individual human. And uh, she talks about Tico one day had taken up a new game of sliding down a banister, and he was very proud of his skill. And he would grab it with his leg back with his toes and slide down, and then just grip it at the end to stop himself. And he, Joanne hadn't seen it, he came into the kitchen and was cooing to her and used certain body language to lure her to see it. She knew what he was doing, she knew he wanted to show her something. Went and watched, and he slid down the banister. She describes that in uh, one of many charming anecdotes in that book. I, met, I add the wagtail. Wagtail is a very small songbird. Uh, one guy describes it just sliding down a skylight window in his loft. This is a pretty flimsy anecdote, and I would say that it's very vulnerable to misinterpretation, but I include it here just because it would be quite telling for a very small passer on a songbird to be sliding down something. And so uh, part of this project about animal pleasure is to encourage people to look for examples of animals engaging in activity that might be pleasurable. And uh, this is a possible example. Food, crucial to survival. You should expect, we should expect that food would be full of rewards for those who need it, or those who have the senses to enjoy it. Um, if you look at fruit, they offer a good example of uh, what Michael Pollan, in his great book, The Botany of Desire, would call the, he, would, he described it something like um, a, well, I can't remember the wording now, but it's sort of like a co-evolutionary arrangement forged over tens of thousands, millions of years between plants and animals. Fruit is an attractant device. It's, it's actually a seed dispersal device, and it evolves to <coughs> attract some other mobile animal. Remember, plants can't move around. They have that disadvantage to get their seeds and pollen around, so they've developed various devices for getting the pollen and the seeds elsewhere. About the correlation, the co evolutionary arrangement between bees and beetles and some insects and pollen, and similarly with fruit. And so the bright colors, the nice smells, and the sweet tastes, you know, they're not just here for us. We enjoy them, but uh, fruit were fruiting long before humans and hominids came down from the trees or where they started out. So we should expect, because of its fundamental importance to survival and reproduction and procreation and all that Darwinian stuff, that animals enjoy it. Food, lovely example of an anthropomorphic picture. Who knows what Clementine the runty piglet that I photographed in 1976 on a farm in Michigan is actually feeling. I just like the picture because it evokes pleasure. Um, but um, it in fact it evokes bliss is the word that comes to my mind when I see that. And I think my mother who's feeding the piglet probably felt a bit of bliss as well, but vicariously. Uh, but we should expect, and it gets back to the earlier part of the talk, we should expect pleasure, uh, food to be very tightly associated with with sensory rewards. And uh, certainly plants give us uh, a lot of evidence to, to expect that's the case. Um, an interesting study that I think is a, one of the best behavioral, I think there may be, the guy who did it is also a physiologist. There's probably some physiological, physiology elements to his work. Uh, evidence for a pleasure aspect of food. This guy, Michel Cabanac, uh, Quebec, in Quebec, in Ontario, has maybe Laval University or possibly McGill. In any event, that's irrelevant here. He put lizards, in this case, uh, iguanas. This is not an iguana, it's an agama, it doesn't matter. He put these big lizards in these terraria where they usually kept in captivity. And he, a typical situation, they're under a sunlamp, keep it nice and warm. Uh, and they, they're tropical lizards, they need to, be, need to stay warm for the most part. And to avoid cold areas, that's relevant to the scene I'm about to describe. And there was regular chow, processed chow, not very exciting underneath the perch, but in the far end of the terrarium was some treat, a gourmet treat, lettuce. Not something we would get too excited over, but iguanas love lettuce, certainly compared to this daily grind of chow. And so, but the, there was a cost to going and getting the lettuce. And the cost was it was cold over in that part of the terrarium, ice cold, lethally cold if the lizard was to stay there. And so, Cabinet simply set up that situation. You know where this is going to go. The lizard left the hot perch, went and got the lettuce, came back to the hot perch. Much rather, 
evidence for preference of lettuce over chow. Not rocket science and not that, that impressive. But what he did next was to create a dynamic situation. He would vary the <coughs> palatability and desirability of the, the reward with the cost. So by, ch and by changing the temperature and the reward, maybe a wilting piece of lettuce, I don't know what, quite how he varied the qualitative or the attractiveness of the reward, but just different types of food that would be known to be different levels of attractiveness to lizards. He found that they would, they would vary, they would adjust their tendency to go according to the ratio of cost to reward. So it suggests um, a very pretty good sensory awareness and sense of cost benefit that the animal's making. Uh, I would say it's a little bit like our behavior. It's sort of like um, shunning the fruit bowl and going out on a stormy night to get donuts. And uh, if it's really storming badly, you're just, or if you're really frigidly cold or rain like crazy, you know, you might just decide to just stay in and have whatever is available. It's not such a treat, perhaps. It wouldn't do to talk about animal pleasure without talking about sex. And uh, where shall I start with this? Let's see what the next slide is that we got. I gave this talk in Edinburgh about 11 days ago, and it was a family audience, so I kind of skipped over sex. Uh, but um, one way I looked at this question, you know, what's the evidence that animals experience pleasure in sex? We can, again, make the argument by analogy. It's pleasurable to humans. Animals have similar sensory systems. We might expect it to be rewarded. And yet, nature documentary, sex is typically, when it's presented at all, is typically all business. And it's perfunctory, and it's just <coughs> making copies of yourself. No, it doesn't seem to be much. Rarely is there any kind of any sense of any fun involved. And yet, we should expect it to be pleasurable because it's so important in a Darwinian evolutionary sense. It's what moves our genes to the next generation. So we should expect, even though it's not necessary for survival, it is necessary for survival of copies of genes. And therefore, we should expect that it's rewarded by nature, not just, not just for us. And one way of looking at it, then, is to see uh, how much non-procreative sexual behavior there is. If sex is just business for animals, they should not waste time and energy, because energy is important <coughs> for nature. Doing it outside of situations where it's bound to the uh, copies of your offspring. One could argue that maybe the animal is just confused and making a mistake. But there's a lot of examples of animals engaging in sexual activity in nature that makes it unlikely that they are simply confused and that they have no idea they're not leaving copies of it or they're not actually possibly appropriate. Some examples, mating outside of the breeding season happens quite often. Mating during pregnancy, menstruation, incubation, periods when clearly you're not gonna leave young. More examples. Uh, animals engaging in orgies, and these can be any kind of sex combination, could be all one sex. In fact, there's a book that I should mention called Biological Exuberance. It came out in 1999 by a biologist based in Seattle named Bruce Bagamill. And it's a really splendid survey, very scholarly survey of same-sex coupling in nature. He set out to sort of focus on um, homosexual same-sex coupling. And I use it in quotes because it's just because two males can engage in sexual activity doesn't mean necessarily they're homosexual. It could be they're making the best of a limited situation. It could be they're bisexual and they engage in heterosexual coupling at the time when it's available. So there's a lot of it, dynamics. But I, I get the sense from reading Bagman's book that he set out to look at the same sex stuff and found that there's so much more interesting stuff about sexual behavior in non humans that he sort of broadened his scope a little bit. And he talks about things like orgies. And other, there are other sources on this. Uh, Self-stimulation, quite widespread, certainly among mammals. There's some evidence in birds. Uh, oral genital stimulation, you can read. Homosexual behavior, interspecies mating. So there's quite a range of shenanigans among animals that is manifestly not going to leave offspring. And to me, that's supportive evidence that the animals are highly uh, motivated to engage in behavior. Touch. I have 38 minutes, and uh, I don't like to keep my audience sitting so long. I probably would be about another five to eight minutes, I would guess. Maybe eight to 10. Touch. Very important, very physical sense. The sense of touch. It's the most physical of all. You have to be actually 
there has to be some physical contact to feel touch. This is just a quote from a book about baboons, a male being groomed by two females, and um, he seemed to enjoy it intensely, relaxing in total abandon every muscle limp except for that part of his body held out to be groomed. I believe it was an arm in this case. I just like that because it's evocative of how we might feel, I don't mean women or men, uh, in a similar situation, to be pampered physically like that. Uh, animals scratch themselves to relieve an itch. Uh, whether that's a positive or negative experience, the itch is probably negative, but the feeling of relieving an itch um, is, is, is positive. And the postures and the engagement of animals when they scratch, not proof that they're feeling any pleasure, uh, but it certainly provoke, provoke, provokes, it's provocative evidence that they do. You get the sense that a lot of this because you can't get inside an animal's mind, you can't know what they're feeling. That's the dogma of behaviorism. It's absolutely correct. You can, I cannot prove that you feel, and you can't prove that I can. In fact, there's a word for that notion. It's solipsism. The notion that I'm the only conscious feeling organism in the universe, and, and it's logically incontrovertible that you could, you could be all robots sent from outer space and can't feel anything. So a lot of the argument for pleasure is building, sort of building weight of evidence. I can't give you definitive proof, really. I can't ultimately give you definitive proof. And no one can. No scientist, no matter how clever or innovative, can do that. But we accept tacitly, we accept as common sense, because of empathy relating to our own experience, that other humans feel ah, the same kind of sweet feelings that we do. And so I'm extending that simply beyond the, hum the barrier between the human and all the other species. And not, not all the other species excuse me, between the human and some other species. Where we draw that line, that's a whole other thing. I would just say draw it in pencil, because you may want to move that line. These are meerkats or surrogates. They're highly social mammals in the, in the uh, uh, mongoose family, African. And it gets cold on those African plains at night, and they huddle up to keep warm. I'm getting a comfort here. Comfort's an interesting phenomenon. Comfort is about maintaining homeostasis, maintaining a stable internal state, be it body temperature. Um, well, that's the one we usually think of. And, uh, you know, the way it works is, again, it's, it's nature rewarding us for adaptive behavior. If we're cold, it feels good to get warm. It, it makes us, it, and, and it also brings us close to a, a stable state. If we stay in the cold area, we could die. So it's very important to get warm. We get rewarded. If you're cold and you put your hand into a warm bowl of water, the experience has a great feeling. If you were boiling hot and you put your hand in the exact same bowl of water, it would be unpleasant. People don't do this. Like, it's not harmful necessarily, but you don't like the feeling. There's a word for that, alesthesia. And it's, 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 it evokes the notion that it's adapted to do things that increase your comfort level. The opposite is if you're boiling hot, really, really hot, you'd be out in the desert, putting your hands in some really icy cold water, might be a bit of a guilt, but it really feels very good. Or going into a place where the air condition feels good, right? You reward you for trying to maintain homeostasis. If you went, if you're really hot and you go into a hot place, it doesn't feel as good. It feels negative in the same place because of your internal state. So that's a little bit of an aside, but uh, this is sort of comfort maintenance. It's hot at night, cold at night, it probably feels good to bundle up and get in the crowd. And the ones on the lee side uh, or on the wind side where the wind's hitting, if it's coming from the left, uh, if you observe these kinds of clusters, these dynamic huddles, as they're, they're called, if you observe them over the period of 10, 20, 30 minutes, the ones outside will uh, move around to where the lily side. And over the course of a few hours, these clusters can actually migrate to the weather media across the ground. I'd like to see a time-lapse uh, film of that, actually, someday. I'm going to finish up by, well, almost finish up by going over some what I call transcendent pleasure. These are just some examples of words and types of pleasure that uh, I haven't really touched on yet. Joy. It's a feeling we kind of relate to. I give a few examples in my book, uh, anecdotes about animals being, being let out into the pasture, into the outdoors, after being, in, being indoors all winter long because of the long, harsh, harsh winter in, say, the tropical species. They often kick and gallop and they show behavioral evidence of being delighted and ecstatic and joyous. Functionslust is a German word which essentially means that animals will do what they're good at and that's rewarding and it's like a positive feedback loop. 
Uh, this is a serval. Servals often catch birds. They are splendid leapers. They can jump really high. Um, and I would say that function plus may be at work here. The animal leaps probably a lot in play. It's fun. It's enjoyable. So they get sort of rewarded for doing behaviors that are very important. And so when they actually jump in the hunt, uh, it's, it's also rewarding because they'll often get their food that way. So it's sort of a positive feedback loop encouraging uh, adaptive behaviors through pleasure. Flowers were blooming long before we came along. Uh, they're not just for our appreciation. They're aesthetically pleasing, they're bright colors. They're big flags saying, come to me, I will reward you. The reward is typically nectar. And the benefit to the plant is pollen gets moved from one plant to the other. Incidentally, some plants hoodwink animals. Their orchids that mimic the abdomens of female bees attracts the male bee. He comes in, he mates, quote unquote, with the orchid. Uh, frantically, and then goes to another flower. Orchid gets the uh, pollen moved around. Orchid gives no nectar. The reward in this case is sort of a sexual thing. Now, I'm not going to start venturing out and saying that bees feel pleasure, but it's a very interesting phenomenon that the bees will con continue to do this when apparently there's no adaptive benefit to the bee. Uh, getting back to aesthetics, bright colors on birds. This is a rainbow lark heap, an Australian species it would appear that they have an aesthetic appreciation for bright colors. Love. We have enough, enough trouble defining love in our own species, so uh, how are we to define it in animals? But I would just say this, that animals who live long lives, and parrots are a good example, close pair bonds tend to make for, make for life. Uh, incidentally, they will show all the indicators of grief if they lose their partner, and they won't necessarily link up with someone else. These are the kinds of species that we might expect feelings of love, rewarding feelings of love. Love is, of course, not all about reward. It's also about heartbreak and heartache and other negative things. But the way lovebirds, that's their name, and other parrots interact uh, suggests a uh, positive reward from the intimacy of what we would call love. Affection, the mother-parent parent offspring bond, very crucial to survival and adaptiveness. And so we should expect it to be favored. And uh, I would suggest that there's a lot of positive emotion wrapped up in this, in this interaction between parents and offspring. In this particular case, a ringtail lemur with her baby. I say her, it's possible to be a male. I don't know enough about the social structure of ringtail lemurs. In some species, males, dads, presumptive dads, spend quite a lot of time when they're young, too. So we shouldn't assume it's a female or a mother. You know, there's one I don't have a slide on here, and I really should, and I'm just going to tell you this briefly because it's, a, it's kind of a neat example, another example. I would say some of the most provocative cases of, that suggest, of animal behavior that suggests pleasure would be those where it may be maladaptive, where it may actually not be benefiting for the animals to engage in the behavior, but they do it anyway. Maybe it gets back a little bit to the, some of that sexual stuff I was talking about, but there's another example, and that is uh, substance abuse, if you like. We know about the phenomenon in our own species. It's a great social problem. Uh, there are some animals who engage in, appear to engage in substance abuse, and it's probably not beneficial to them, but they do it, and it's probably uh, adaptive. Uh, sorry, probably maladaptive, but they do it, and the reason they probably do it is because it's simply fun or rewarding, and they get a kick out of it. Elephants are known to make a beeline sometimes for fermenting marula fruits and some other fruits, perhaps, uh, the, and then they behave rowdily afterwards in a way that suggests that they are actually enjoying an alcohol high. Uh, but there are other examples, and a really neat one is uh, lemurs. That last slide is a lemur. These are you know, uh, primates in Madagascar. And also a capuchin monkey, the New World monkey. They uh, will take these large millipedes. You know what millipedes are. Pick them up, mouth them, rub them. And the millipedes have these very powerful defensive chemicals that they release. And uh, the chemicals have a uh, fumigating effects on the monkeys and it causes them to start drooling and get floppy and show all signs of a drug-induced euphoria. Uh, they, and they will pass this millipede around like the marijuana joint at a party. It's very reminiscent. Uh, but some of them, not that I would know anything about that. And then when they're done, they discard them, the millipede, usually unharmed, although probably really pissed off. And then, uh, you know, and then, and then they're floppy for a while. And, and I would say it's probably maladaptive because it's, it's not very safe to be clued out you know, in nature. There could be a predator there looking, looking for you and you'd be an easier target if you're in a stupor. So it's just an interesting example of how 
uh, you know, even though pleasure evolved for reward, and it's meant to be adaptive, there may be cases where animals engage in it and it's not adaptive. And that would be even more, more compelling evidence for pleasure, for the seeking. All right, to finish up, take home message. What are the implications if we acknowledge pleasurable experiences in animals? We generally agree that we have, uh, it's a, that it's a noble goal to minimize animal pain and suffering. Uh, I've included the word unnecessary in here because this is the great qualifier that is often used to defend certain things that we do that are clearly not in the animal's interests. I'm thinking here of using animals in, uh, to, for meat, uh, raising, uh, using animals for research and testing, we may argue that it benefits us. It's clearly not, not, not beneficial to them. The, the Animal Welfare Act in the US is a good example of a well-meaning piece of legislation that's meant to protect animals. Uh, but it's still, even though it's there, just about any procedure in a lab can be done if the researcher convince, can convince his or her colleagues that it's justified, that there's a, there's a benefit to be going from that. So um, that's why I put the word unnecessary in there. For those like myself who work in animal protection, uh, it's, an, it's a frustrating qualifier. Uh, but nonetheless, scientists and non-scientists alike are all for minimizing pain and suffering. They may qualify it, but it's a goal that we generally agree with and agree on. What about pleasure? Well, you know, I have an obligation not to go and cause pain and suffering to another human being, another person, another sentient being. I don't have an obligation to provide you with pleasure, though. It's a bit different. It's, it perhaps has less moral weight. But where I do think we have obligations and duties is to not deprive an individual of the uh, capacity to go and fulfill and seek the pleasures that life may hold for them. So if animals can indeed feel pleasures, as I've tried to argue and convince you tonight, then I would say by extension, their sentiency is expanded and our obligations to them are expanded. Not to go and provide them with pleasure, but to not deprive them of pleasure which is what we do when we keep them in factory farms and small lab cages and certain zoos and a number of things. We, we use them for entertainment, hunting, fishing, rodeos, etc. We do a lot of things that are clearly not in the interest of the animals. And I would say, yes, the pain and suffering is the first front and center reason why that's a moral issue, but depriving them of opportunities to go and lead lives that they've naturally evolved to do, where they have these highly motivated behaviors is an extension of our moral duty to them. So that's, in my view, the relevance of pleasure to the question of our moral uh, connection with animals. And I just finish up with this cartoon which sort of flips something on its head and looks at it from the animal's perspective. And I'll be happy to take questions from anyone. Thank you. Context of altruism as a sort of seemingly maladaptive behavior or trait uh, within animals. Um, you mean altruism in the sense that helping another is costly to oneself? Yeah. Yeah. Um, altruism. For anyone who doesn't know what it means, it's you know it's an example of a behavior where you put yourself at risk to help another, and you may know the term kin selection. Often in the context of animals putting themselves at risk to help another is that you're helping someone who shares copies of your genes. And so there's some genetic and adaptive basis for going out on a limb, so to speak, and helping. There are some examples that make that in nature that make that a little bit hard to explain. Uh, there are now known to be some examples where animals will help non-kin and put themselves at some cost. Uh, an interesting example. This may not be an example, this may be a case of kin selection, but I think there's some evidence that uh, vampire bats um, will share blood uh, with others that are not related. I know there's some examples of non relative health and altruism. Well, the vampire bats is an example of that. Uh, vampire bats, getting blood, finding a blood meal isn't always a, a sure shot deal. And sometimes an individual may go without for two or three days in a row. And if it gets up to three days, they're pretty much at the end of the tether and they're two weeks flying in. But, or if a female is giving birth that night, she can't go out. Uh, others will actually 
regurgitate. It sounds gross to us, but they will help help them in giving the meal. So, but there are some examples uh, in nature of altruistic behavior that are that appears to be non-kin related, and there may be some other theories as to why that's happening. But um, it suggests at least that the animals are that the just pure natural selection and selfish genes are not enough to explain that behavior. Yes. Getting you talked about um, like stress levels and reps and they're being handled and things like that. Is there any way to measure maybe like a positive clinical and being released or something right. like that for right. animals? Great question, and I really should have included that in my talk, physiological measures of pleasure. Uh, dopamine is a, a chemical produced by the brain uh, in uh, that's associated with pleasure, and it's known to be associated with pleasure in human studies, and lo and behold, positive affect studies in other species have found rats, most notably because they're so well studied, have um, noted the dopamine production in their brains. I'll mention one other study, Camard horses, is a, 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 probably a subspecies of horse. Um, these horses are very tactile and they groom each other, they lick each other on the neck and nibble each other on the neck. And they have particular locations of the neck that they like, that they seem to favor. And so the researchers thought, well, let's see how they respond to when we do it. And they put heart monitors, non-invasive heart monitors on the animals so they can monitor uh, heart rate. And that was their measure of positive affect. If the heart rate went down, that was considered to be positive affect. And they found that when they groomed them randomly, it, it didn't really have much effect. But when they focused on those, grooming, I mean, in this case, brushing, when they focused on those areas of the neck, that the animals tend to favor the heart rates came statistically significantly down. So that's a couple of examples of ways that, yes, we can measure physiologically positive effects just as we can in negative effects. Yes? So if non-human animals can sense pain and pleasure, are they vulnerable to disorders of pain and pleasure, like, for example, depression, like human animals are in the right. natural environment? Yeah, good question. There's a, there's a book that just came out recently called Health, Mental Health and Well-Being in Animals. And in a way, that title is sort of an answer to the question. That it, it's, a, it's edited by a veterinarian named Franklin McMillan. And it's, a, it's an edited volume. It's volume. So it's contributions from various people, including some of the people I mentioned tonight. And um, there's a few chapters in there that do talk about the psych animal psychology and psychological disorders in animals. I had that slide about um, the stereotypes, self-mutilation. These are some manifestations of mental, of, of mental problems. There's a, new, a fairly new field, a growing field, in, in, sort of in the veterinary realm. I don't know, I'm not sure if it's in the veterinary realm, but it's animal psychologists. There are probably some quacks out there, but there are, there, are, there are some very reputable animal psychologists who, you know, if someone has a dog who spends all day digging away at the door, it's generally diagnosed as a separation anxiety, and the, animal, the person comes home and the door is in shreds, and it's a problem, the dog's unhappy, the door's getting destroyed. It's a real issue. So uh, uh, an effective psychologist hopefully would be able to come out, interview, not interview the dog, interview the uh, guardian, uh, but to observe the dog's behavior and probably do some tests behavioral tests, and then uh, suggest a remedy and, and work on it. It may not be a quick solution, but that's an example of a common behavioral problem. And you could say psychological disorder in a dog with separation anxiety. And uh, you know, with proper treatment, just like with humans, and it may include uh, pharmacological reasons. Uh, it may be one of these. Any other questions? Okay, well I'll be here.